it does make sense. And I guess the, the flip, the flip side of this, of the knowing who you are as a coach, so you can then just execute what you have to while just being true to yourself. The other part is like you said, dealing with other human beings. They're not just athletes. They're not just clients. And so the other part of, of that is, is listening, right? So yeah. you have to, you have to listen to what's going on on the other side. So I got a question for you on that. Um, mm. How do you listen and how do you open up to, you know, uh, what the players have to say, what the athletes, what the people have to say, but without turning into a, a pushover and, you know, letting yourself go into, oh, I'm just going to do what the athlete said. I, I, I'll give you a, mm. you know, practical situation in the, the club where I, where I do the physical prep side of things. Um, they were quite adamant at the beginning of this season about being open with players, about yep. listening to players, about receiving feedback from players. Uh, but then I felt like there was still quite a bit of, well, we're asking for feedback, but then sometimes we'll just say, well, they can't just have what they want all the time. So we'll just do what yeah. we think is right. So how do you find that happy medium between, you know, listening and then doing the right thing afterwards? Well, that last thing's a really interesting point. It's a great example because all that is, is a challenge of ego. And so what it does, we can't, you know, we can't give them everything they want. But why? Because by that um, that scenario, we actually feel like we're losing power. It's a massive power statement. It's like, well, I'm a coach, so I know best. No, you're a coach. You know enough. That's all it is. You know just enough to get them over the line. Because you, if you were the best, you'd probably be playing the sport still. Or in your day, you would have been the best ever. So it's kind of like, that's where, from that last thing, and that's what you understand, it's actually just an ego attachment and egocentric people, which everyone is to a certain level. Like, it's about understanding how your ego gets in your way. So then if you, if you take that right back to the beginning about not being a pushover, if we look at what a pushover is, it's someone who gets taken advantage of by someone who doesn't respect them to then do what they want to do to, to get where they want to go. So if we take it right the way back, if your first um, relationship development is, is completely authentic, <clears throat> then you're, you're never going to be a pushover because you're always going to be respected. And the way that you generate respect with athletes, I believe, and you never become a pushover is by being incredibly honest. And you have to be incredibly honest about your intentions. I mean, you can't control what people do. That's fine. The, the relationship will get to a point where that control is challenged. And then you make a decision. But the precursor before that is coming with openness, honesty, and giving respect rather than accepting and expecting respect. Because I've had conversations with athletes that go, what are we doing? I said, oh, actually, I, I don't really know. Like, we're just figuring this out right now. Today, we're just figuring it out, and we got to work together. I've had the best progress with those people. Because we fail, and this is what something that grinds my gears slightly, is we fail to really keep in our forefront of our mind that our profession only exists because people play the game. We're so dependent on those individuals, but yet we continue to undermine their own innate abilities. Yeah, it, it's funny. Now that you say that, it brought to mind something that I've been doing with my, my private training clients for a while, not necessarily mm. as much with the, with the rugby team that I work with or the other athletes that I work with, um, but it's a good reflection point. I, I always ask my clients when I start with them, what do you think you need to achieve your goals? Yeah. That's going to be the, the start of the program. You know, they might yeah. say, oh, I want to lose, I want to lose fat, so I want to do crunches. I'll be like, okay, we'll do crunches. Yeah. And then yeah. we'll, start, we'll start with that, get buy-in, and then slowly mm -hmm. educate them and then show them that there's other things we can do and here's how we do them and here's why it's good and here's why it might be, you know, better use of our time. But I've, I've never actually done that in the context of, you know, a team because I, mm. I guess it, there is a big difference between talking to one person and then talking yeah. 
to 40. So how, yeah. how do you practically, how do you make that work with, with the whole team? Well, I did it. I actually did it with, I was with a group of players on the touchline when I was at Ealing and they were like, I think I talked to about this before and, and they were like, Oh, something about coaching. I said, do you know what? I became the best coach. I actually stopped caring because when I, when I actually removed the fact that I have any real control over the outcome and accepted the fact that it's just a decent guess, everything else is easy. Everything else is so easy because you become, you become process driven. You become feel driven. You become uh, this is what I liken to the artist when you don't analyze because you're reacting, you're instinctive. And, and when you, those coaching experiences are the, they're the ones that you remember. They're the sessions that you remember. And, and that, that comes from, you know, with the group of, um, the group of players that, we were talking about at the end when I first sat down with the boys at Scottish. Like I said to them, it's like my goal is to make you ready to play rugby. I don't really know how we're going to do that yet because I've never met you all. But this is my intention, and I'm gonna, and it's going to be the best way that I think for you right now. And let's do it together. Let's not do it separate. Because um, I hate the the identity that the, the SNC coach gets because a lot of them ruin it for everyone else because they're not for the players. And it, it's got to be from the SNC. It's got to be from everybody else too, right? The, the staff mm -hmm. and the managers, everybody's at the service of the, the players, just like a CEO is actually there to do what they need for the employees to do their job as best as possible. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. It's like your reputation will get you through the door. But your 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 daily process keeps you there, and and your your and this is the thing. Like, you ever thought about it? Like, why some managers keep their jobs but they don't win titles? Like, why more managers get time than others, and it and they don't actually achieve the ultimate. It's like I. It's because they've got the dressing room, they've got the belief. They've got the respect. They know when it's like from an SNC point of view, like they know there's times when you put the pedal down, but there's times when you take it off. And there's a couple of ways that you can use, you look like you, it's really important to deliver to your athletes is, is to show them if you monitor, make use of that data, demonstrate that you make a decision off that data. Otherwise they lose respect in the data and they lose respect in you. But then also, pre-plan and forecast adaptation because you can so then you can say to them right to like you have these milestones of when i'm actually going to unload you so please don't hold back like i don't like keeping players in the dark about time off or what's coming up next i've been in those situations all the time and i think it's fucking terrible because you treat them like children they behave like children mm. and and so like you will you then become the relationships becomes disingenuous mm. so then when you're trying to get everyone on the same same wavelength yes we're fighting archetypal ideals which are just driven from fear but we all want to go in the same direction and i put an instagram thing up the other day i was just talking to someone and i was like well let's be honest sports science evolves develops faster than technical coaches evolve because this like Technical coaching is generational. Sports science is like, it, how long does it take to get a paper published? Six months? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like generation versus six months. Just chill the fuck out. Focus on a few other different bits and pieces that will get you over the line more. Yeah, I had a great experience with that this last summer with the guys uh, talking about, you know, not keeping them in the dark. It was mm. half a product of COVID and then half a product of, I thought that might be a good idea. <sighs> Actually, I wrote the preseason and then mm. laid it out on a quick, you know, keynote presentation, filmed it, sent it to everybody and said, this is why we're doing it. This is how we're progressing and why. Uh, yeah. And then we'll adjust along the way, obviously, if we have to. Do you have any questions? Did a Zoom call with questions? And the first day, uh, you know, we had 30, 35 guys show up. And throughout the whole preseason, we had between 30 and 40 guys, which is definitely a, a high from, from my memory and, and many players as yeah. well. 
and they were just they just showed up and they knew what they were getting into and they knew what was expected of them and then it was just kind of you know just roll with it let's just fucking do the work and there, there was no like 15 minutes of explaining and this is how it works it was like no no the sheet is printed out it's in the changing rooms read it before yeah. you get on the pitch and then you know exactly where and when what's happening and that actually and and i mean we're we're an amateur team we, we train twice yeah. a week uh you know most people have you know all of them have day jobs and uh, yes yeah. it still worked great and that the guys actually took something out of it at the end of the preseason which which i think is is always a plus because i mean and I, that's probably the same in many places but especially here mm. the old school you know strength and conditioning and rugby is all about just banging your head against a, a brick until until it bleeds and then you bang a few more times just to make sure that you did enough um yeah to try and trying to change that is is tough I do, yeah and I, I don't mean to interrupt you there but it's a really no, interesting no, no. point because i I've, I've done i've done that process that you you did with a part-time team whilst working with a full-time team at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. right <clears throat> the the difference between the two is well I mean, from my coaching, I was trying it with a full-time team, but I was in charge of a part-time team. And the different differences in those situations, you respect the fact that you don't have a lot of time with these people because you don't, like, even though you, if you may pay them a match fee or something like that, you don't provide their living. Whereas in a full-time environment, there is a certain level of ownership of the individual. Mm -hmm to do X, Y, Z. Do you know why? Because I pay your fucking bills. It's another power play. It's like, it is so, like when you, when you start thinking about these things, well, it's all just ego driven power moves. But when you actually, if you would turn, and, and I was like, I worked at a club where on a Monday, two days post game, the players would be in at seven o'clock in the morning for breakfast. They wouldn't leave till four o'clock in the afternoon. They'd only do one weight session, one meeting, and one team session that was it from seven till four like good way to start to start your week like and do lower body game day plus two cheers mm -hmm. like so from that point of view it's just because you pay them it doesn't mean you've got to keep them there and i did some consulting with um a football club premier league football club and i was up there for a couple of days with them Shout out Burnley Football Club. The guys there, Tom, Mark, bloody legend. Sean Dice is a hero. Like, like, because they were just amazing. I couldn't speak highly of them. And it's not because Tom's got ginger hair like myself, but he, <laughs> like, like, they just got it right. They've just got it right about inspiring people. And he's one on guys. Like, they got Burnley out of the championship, brought them up. They're, they're steady in the Premier League. And he, he values his players. Like he values his players. Like there's some really amazing things. That I, I don't, I can't really name names or anything like that, but you know, there's a player that he wasn't keeping on, but because he helped them get up and there was a, you know, it's sport contracts change. It was like, you're, you're training with us to keep right until you get a move as long as it takes. Like how that guy will feel so valued and so enriched by a very tough time and then but like on a monday morning every player you wouldn't come in till later so every player could take their kids to work to school and have breakfast with their families like that is how you coach you have to coaching is life as well you have to know what's in it for the players. What is their end goal? Where do they want to go with it? And like you said, whether it's, oh, I just want to have a good time on the weekend or oh, I want to win a championship or, oh, I want to move up and try to, you know, play in a higher league. If you can have yeah. those honest conversations, it reminds me of, uh, you know, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it talks about that. How first thing you do with an employee is you sit down and you ask them what, where they want to go. What do they want to do? Have an honest conversation. And if you can, if you know where they want to go, then you know what you're going to have to do to help them. And, yeah. and that's going to be an, an honest relationship from the start. But if you're mm -hmm. just trying to, to push your workload on, on someone who's got other yeah. aspirations, then why the fuck would they care about working for you? Oh, exactly. And in strength and conditioning as well, that big fight for the bottom, which I've, I was in for a long, long time, is that the people above will keep 
giving you more work to make you feel like you're progressing and they'll just keep you where you are like i can't wait for the day where i get enough expansion in my company and stuff that i hire people and they go i want your job those are the people i want to work for me and the, the real answer is that you can't have my job because you're not me however I can make you a shit ton of money and allow you to do it pretty much all on your own. That's what I want to give you. You want what I've created, not my job. Mm. And that's, that's what you want to give to people. And like, and it's the same if you're a director of rugby, then you've got a group of players in front of you. Like my, like why, why hire a, why, why buy a player in and then don't play him because like, he's not got your, um, he doesn't fit your system. Well, you fucking scouted him. Like, you know, his physical qualities and it's like, and then it, it underpins like behind that, there needs to be a better um, appraisal system when transferring talent. Like players should have responsibilities to individuals. Cause remember it is all about the players and we tie this S and C podcast, but we tie this back into the role of the S and C coach for that. They need to be understanding the metrics of where their athletes are. Mm. So when that athlete goes, you know, I've had conversations with players when they've left clubs. I was like, tell me what you need. I'll give you a packet. I can give you your numbers to your agent. So you know where you are, know your weekly volumes, know everything to help you, like your passport. It's not just like a sell and, 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 uh, and trade sort of scenario. And it gives me to one point actually um, about this. When I was working at, at a club, um, there was a guy that got injured and he, I was doing the rehab at the time amongst many other things. So I was there to make me feel like I was progressing. I was just tired. <laughs> um, and he, he, I was like, so I sat down, had a meeting with him uh, and I was like, oh, what do you want to achieve? Da, 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 da. And, and there'd been whispers about him signing for another club and stuff like this. And I was like, I was like, mate, come on. 18 months from now, where are you playing rugby? And he was like, named the club. I was like, right, what shape do they want you to be in? X, Y, Z. Okay, that's the plan. My role is not to help you get back to train for this team, even though they employ me. My role is to help you get to where you want to be. Irrespective. And that's what knowing where they want to be. Do you know what I mean?